This is Phil Kopman with a tutorial on security vulnerabilities. A system has security vulnerabilities if there are one or more points in the system susceptible to attack. Those points include hardware, software, network, people, infrastructure, and the organization deploying or operating the system. Two terms we'll be using are first an exploit is a method of converting a vulnerability into a security breach. And second, an attack is when someone uses an exploit to actually breach system security. That means for a successful attack, there has to be a vulnerability that has an exploit available that is actually used in an attack. Anti-patterns for vulnerabilities include ignoring vulnerabilities until after an attack, assuming vulnerabilities will not be exploited, such as having unsecure embedded networks, or not worrying about reverse engineering of devices, or having hidden functionality that you assume no one will figure out. A significant vulnerability is often assuming that passwords will actually be secure in practice. Poor password hygiene is a common vulnerability in embedded systems. Perhaps the most obvious way that passwords can be a problem is if they are weak or commonly used by many individuals. For numeric passwords, it's common to see 1234 or 777 or 888888. If your system has one of those passwords, you can pretty much guarantee someone will try and guess it and be able to get in. There are some text passwords that are also very common, such as the word password, or I love you, or QWERTY being the order of the keys on a standard QWERTY keyboard. The list of bad passwords is not limited to this, as we'll see in a moment, but these are the usual suspects that appear commonly. Less obvious, but perhaps even worse, is having a factory master password. The idea for a factory master password is that you're concerned that users will lock themselves out of the system. So there's a second password that you do not tell the users that the support staff know, and that password will get you into any system. The problem with this is, as soon as some user knows that master password, if it's the same in all systems, it will get loose and all the users will know it. Now you might say, well, we would never tell a user a password, but in real life, the master password gets revealed a couple ways. One is a copy of the factory service manual gets posted on the internet with the master password in it. And another one is there's some customer that's a two or three hour drive away from the nearest service center and it's 2 a.m. and the customer is in real trouble and the service person says, you know what, I'll just tell the user the master password and, and tell them not to write it down. But of course, the user is going to write it down so they don't have to make the phone call the next time at 2 a.m. If you have a factory master password, it will get loose and it will cause your system to be insecure. Another common issue is using the same cryptographic key in all systems. For example, the Keylock car remote was broken due to using the same manufacturer key in all units for the same car company. In the case of Keylock, there were some other random bits on top of the manufacturer key, but the fact was that once you had the manufacturer key, it was pretty easy to brute force your way in the rest of the way. It's important to use long enough cryptographic keys, including passwords, that a brute force search of all possibilities will not get lucky in a feasible amount of time. There's a website that gives advice from the US government as to how big a password to use depending on the year. Every year, the minimum safe size for a cryptographic key gets a little bit longer because computers get faster, and that means they can brute force attack the key in a little bit shorter time. A commonly used key size these days is 256 bits for symmetric cryptography and 3072 bits for public key. However, you don't worry about what the key length is today. You worry about what the key length should be at the end of life of your system, which in an embedded system might be 5 or 10 or 20 years away. So you should go to that website, figure out how long it will be until your systems retire, and make sure they support a key length up to the length in that year, not the current year. There are a number of usability considerations when setting passwords that are beyond the scope of what we'll talk about, 
but the usual complete gibberish password is prone to failures, for example, of people writing them down and posting them in a public place. So be careful when you select a password policy and make sure that you've researched the latest recommendations for both security and usability. So-called Internet of Things devices are particularly problematic for default passwords. As an example, Brian Krebs's blog was hit by a 665 gigabit per second distributed denial of service attack that was said to come from hundreds of thousands of compromised Internet of Things devices. The issue with these devices is that there are huge numbers of them, and if any particular device has a default password, there may be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of the devices out there, all with exactly the same default password. The Mirai botnet exploits this and uses only a fairly few number of passwords that it tries, and they're listed right here. The idea is it goes out with this very small dictionary of passwords and tries different IP addresses, trying to log in with just those sets of credentials. There aren't that many. And it finds out that it can get a half million devices that it can log in and compromise just with this set of credentials. The idea is that a default password that is not changed by the user or a master password that becomes known can make huge numbers of devices vulnerable to be converted into botnets that are then used to launch distributed denial of service attacks or otherwise cause havoc. While many of these default passwords are the usual suspects of very easily guessed passwords, there are a few that are kind of interesting. For example, the one I've circled, 7UJ, MK, and so on, is a moderately random password that would be difficult to guess by chance and would take a while to brute force. But the point is, because it's the same on every single device, once you find out that's the default password, then you don't need to guess, you just try it. So even a seemingly randomized password, if it's the same on every device and becomes compromised, is no better than 1234. Another common source of vulnerabilities is mistakes in using cryptography. This means the cryptographic math might be just fine, but the way the cryptographic math is deployed has problems that are more easily attacked than by actually breaking the crypto. As an example, there are some smart light bulbs that have to set up networks. So you program the first light bulb and you don't wanna to have to connect and reprogram every single light bulb as you set it in. The light bulb makers solve this the following way. The first light bulb you install, you have to connect to, you have to teach it how to go on Wi-Fi, and so on. But rather than program every single light bulb, once you have the first light bulb set up, that light bulb automatically configures any other light bulb that's installed in your house. This makes it really easy to install additional light bulbs. But the way it does it is by sending the Wi-Fi password to the light bulb. So anything that says, hey, I'm a light bulb, gets the Wi-Fi password including an attacker with a cell phone that says, hey, I'm a light bulb, and whatever light bulb is in the house will cough up the Wi-Fi password, and now the attacker is into the entire network. Typical mistakes for using cryptography include sending initial passwords or secrets without encrypting or without authenticating to make sure that only legitimate devices are getting the information. Another mistake is using known flawed protocols, such as flawed secret key exchange algorithms and flawed software. Just because you downloaded something from the internet doesn't mean it's correctly implemented or that it works. Another mistake is implementing your own cryptography from your own secret algorithm or even from books. Typing in the code from a book often will introduce subtle mistakes that are difficult to catch into your system. Another mistake is permitting weak passwords or weak keys. And finally, a very common mistake is not applying security patches and having systems run for months or even years with vulnerabilities that could have been patched but weren't. A problem particularly prevalent in embedded systems is attacks tailored to embedded networks. It's common for system designers to say, we have a proprietary protocol, and so no one can possibly figure it out. The reality is that proprietary protocols will not protect you against attacks. A poster child for this is the automotive CAN network, controller area network. 
that network is customized by every car company with different types of messages. The theory is that if you keep secret the message dictionary so you don't know which message does what, then an attacker won't be able to attack you. In practice, that does not work. It's very easy to get access to a CAN bus. It's very easy to get tools that will analyze CAN messages. And a little bit of trial and error generally gets you into the system. Think about it. If there's a message for turning the steering wheel and it's a secret, and you turn the steering wheel, and only one message type has data changing, you know that's the steering wheel. That kind of approach will get you very far in a CAN network in a car to the point where these researchers were able to reprogram the dashboard just by reverse engineering the CAN messages with moderately little effort. If you think your system is secure because you did not tell anyone your message definitions, think again. Another source of vulnerability is physical access to the system. A significant problem for embedded systems is that the attacker can often buy one and reverse engineer it, or get access to one and pull components out, and so on. They're not in locked, guarded machine rooms. They're out in the real world where people have access. If you care about someone stealing secrets from your system, such as the design, or secret keys, or algorithms that are protected by trade secret, you have to consider they'll be able to get the hardware design and software design by reverse engineering. Now you might say, well, my intellectual property is inside a ROM inside the chip, and we've disabled the read fuse so there's no way to read it out. We have no problem. But if you say that, you'd probably be wrong. So-called chip peels are no big deal. There are companies that provide these as a service. It's not particularly expensive. It's not particularly hard. They etch their way in, they take photographs of the chip, and they can reverse engineer the hardware design. Uh, depending on the type of memory, it's either easy or moderately hard, but never impossible to recover the bits out of the memory. In general, you can force a chip to give up all its secrets. The cost varies, but if it's an important piece of intellectual property that's worth a lot of money, somebody will find a way to get a chip to give up the secrets. There's an arms race between chip makers that make their chips tamper resistant and companies that learn to reverse engineer tamper resistant chips. While using tamper resistance helps deter casual reverse engineering, if what's in your chip is valuable enough, someone will find a way to extract the secrets from your chip, so that's something to keep in mind. Another common vulnerability in embedded systems is hidden functionality that is supposed to be a secret. You should assume that any secret functionality will be revealed. Special key sequences to get into factory test modes, factory service modes activated by a hidden switch, Easter egg features that are functionality that's not supposed to be there. You have to assume that people will figure out how to activate these things and they will exploit them. Sometimes that will come because the secret gets out from someone who knows the secret and they either brag to their friends or they get fired and reveal the secret as revenge and so on. And sometimes people figure it out just by fooling around. It's said that for some vetting machines, if you hit a certain key sequence, it will put it into maintenance mode, which saves time comparing to unlocking the machine and flipping a switch on the inside. But that time saving comes at the risk that anyone who knows the key sequence can also get it into maintenance mode and perhaps cause some trouble. The kinds of functionality you need to avoid to maintain security include having a service technician master password, having the ability to reset the system without actual physical access to the inside of the system, assuming that a reset is a problem, and having default administrative accounts. While there's tremendous pressure and perceived efficiency in having one account for all maintenance technicians so that they don't have to figure out how to log into a system, Somebody other than a maintenance technician will eventually get hold of that information and have the same access. A potentially better approach is to have a factory test or maintenance jumper on an internal board so that you have to unlock or unscrew an access panel on the machine to get in and physically move a jumper to put it in maintenance mode. 
Of course, that won't stop everyone, but what it does do is stop casual abusers from not even leaving a trail that they tried to access the system and being able to get the system to do what they want. Along with that, it's useful to have a factory test mode warning on any display because it's common for maintenance technicians in a hurry to forget to put the jumper back. So you want to make sure that before they leave, it's easy for them to know that they got the jumper back to the correct position and disabled the special features. A significant problem in systems of all kinds, but especially safety critical embedded systems, are counterfeit components. How do you know that components are legitimate? In some types of applications, the market is awash with fake illegitimate components. These components might fail to meet some specifications, but superficially have the same function. So that looks like they work, but maybe they don't have as good a temperature rating, or maybe they don't have the same wear out functions. So when they're sold, nobody can tell anything's wrong. So the fail in service potentially causing a loss event that should not have happened. Some counterfeits are wholly fake, but some of them are more subtle. Some of them are rejects that failed some sort of testing. For example, a system will fail a speed test or fail a temperature test and be thrown away, but someone will dumpster dive the discards and sell it as a legitimate component. And for all purposes, it is a legitimate component. It was made by the manufacturer, but it failed some test, and whoever buys it won't know that until the system encounters that extreme condition, perhaps years later. Sometimes there's salvaged used components that a system is retired or a board fails and is tossed away and someone repairs the board, but maybe they don't use the same quality repair components or maybe the board is near end of life so it wears out quicker than expected, causing a problem. Sometimes there's clone hardware that has a reduced parts count to save cost. So for example, there might be a power supply that regulates power just fine until a component fails, but there's no safety mechanisms so when it fails, it catches fire instead of doing a safe shutdown. Ask yourself, what if a fake like this shows up in a critical application? This is a big concern in aviation, but as cars become more safety critical, for example, fake counterfeit components inside self-driving cars are going to be an issue that has to be dealt with. The size of this problem is that US Customs seizes one or two million fake integrated circuits per year, and that's just the ones they catch. So this is a significant issue that you will need to deal with if you're building a critical system with a long supply chain. Beyond counterfeit components, what if someone wants to clone your entire product? They may take products that failed acceptance tests, or they may take products that have been retired or disposed of because they're broken. They may fix them up, but not to the same high standards as a factory refurbished component, and they may sell them at a discount or deploy them. Tamper-proofing might help, but if the attack is worth a lot of money, somebody will figure out a way to reverse engineer your tamper-proof system and start making clones. There are cases in which the clones are built by scavenging authentic components. For example, they may find a source of replacement cases and then you manufacture an internal circuit board that's counterfeit and not up to spec, but the external case is the same, the nameplate is the same, how's a customer supposed to know whether or not the entire thing is authentic? Generally, if you need to combat clones of your whole product, you need some sort of way to authenticate and track serial numbers of your product. And you probably need a secure serial number so that an attacker can't guess a valid serial number, but at best can reverse engineer one component and issue a whole bunch of components all with that same serial number. While ultimately you cannot stop them from doing that on a technical basis, you can at least say, here's a serial number that is known for counterfeit. Anything with that serial number, we're gonna assume is a counterfeit and we're not gonna provide support. We're not gonna provide warranty. And if we get sued because it failed, we're gonna say, no, that wasn't ours because that's a known counterfeit serial number. As more and more embedded systems are connected to the internet, there are novel vulnerabilities that have to do with cloud-connected devices. When embedded systems meet internet security, things can get very complicated because you need not only good practices for IT enterprise security, but you also need good practice for embedded system security, and they aren't quite the same. So you need people who know both sets of practices to really get there. Don't forget, if you have a cloud server that can control thousands of embedded devices, if someone gets into the cloud server 
Now they have the ability to mess with thousands of embedded devices. That gives them a much bigger multiplier than simply breaking into a single machine. This picture is obviously faked, but the idea is, what if somebody were able to get into tens or hundreds of thousands of thermostats across the country and do coordinated attacks against the electric grid by cycling air conditioning in a synchronized manner? Those sorts of attacks have been imagined for a while, but as the number of internet-connected devices grows, the issue of having to deal with those kind of attacks becomes more real all the time. If you're building an internet-connected device, here are some questions to ask. How does the cloud server know it's a legitimate device? Sometimes you're selling a service, not just the device, but also a service on the cloud, and you only want to provide that service to legitimate devices and not to counterfeits. Otherwise, someone else could make counterfeit devices, charge a high price, and that leaves you to provide service to a customer who didn't even pay you to buy a device. One way to do this is to deploy each device with a unique public key signed by the factory and require authentication with the cloud server. Another question to ask is how does the user securely connect a smartphone to the device? If the initial key transfer is in the clear, then in principle, anyone overhearing that transmission can get the key to the device. A common technique to address this is to print a unique key or code or password on a sticker inside the unit. But that now means you have to coordinate the programming of the unit with a sticker to make sure the sticker matches what's inside the unit. And what if a user forgets a password? You need a factory reset ability. You do not want a shared master factory password, because that's bad. But you need some sort of way to get the system back to the state where it can accept the initial user password. And finally, ask yourself, how do you plan to do secure update? How do you know that the user won't download software from a rogue server someplace that compromises the system? And what do you do about factory key revocation? If you're doing secure updates with signed updates, if the signing key gets loose, what's your plan for revoking that so that you use a new factory key and you can only use new signed updates? If you don't think through that, you may have a bunch of systems that have to be scrapped and replaced if you have a loss of control of the factory signing key for firmware updates. The list of embedded specific security issues is quite large on top of things that people normally consider for enterprise security. Here are some examples. One issue is that resources are really scarce, so doing heavy-duty cryptographic algorithms might not be feasible because the CPU is not fast enough to do it in a reasonable time, there's not enough memory, or the battery power is so limited that you simply cannot afford to use a lot of heavy-duty encryption. One way to address this is to use a smart card or other dedicated hardware to manage the keys in cryptography to not only make the computations more efficient, but also provide some tamper resistance for the key storage. Embedded networks are generally insecure. Most embedded network protocols were designed in an era where security just was not an issue because it was assumed the embedded system would be isolated from the internet, or the protocol was designed before there even was really an internet. They typically have short network messages for efficiency, no built-in security, and retrofitting security is not straightforward. There are power, memory, and CPU constraints that really make things difficult. Nonetheless, you'll still have to use the embedded network, so you need to think hard about how you plan to address those vulnerabilities. For battery-powered embedded systems, power drain attacks can be a concern. An attacker might send network messages at your system not to break in, but simply to deplete the battery power used to receive and process the messages as a denial of service attack. You might ask, why would someone want to do this? Well, if the device is a security device that runs a security camera or otherwise monitors things, a powertrain attack would take it offline, removing the security feature provided by that device. There are also real-time operation attacks possible. If you overload a system, it might start missing real-time scheduling deadlines because it was never designed to handle that amount of load. You might have a system for which alteration of the design causes a problem. Consider, for example, a car in which someone might intentionally modify the software to improve performance at the expense of defeating emission devices. If you're a car manufacturer and you're being held accountable for meeting emission criteria, 
that could be a problem for you. Embedded system makers may be in a position in which they need to do some combination of deterring alterations to their system or being able to detect and prove that their system was altered if an alteration violates something required by law or makes the system unsafe. Keep in mind that an owner might have extremely good access to the system, so simply saying we won't let them does not work. Finally, you need to make sure that updates are authentic and are actually installed. You might need to ensure that only certified configurations will run so that if a user updates only part of the system or puts in an unauthorized update, the system will no longer run. If your safety argument depends on ensuring the system is updated anytime there's a security issue or a vulnerability discovered that needs to be fixed for safety, you might need to ensure that the updates are installed, but your system might not be continually connected. So you need to consider what to do with systems that have intermittent internet connectivity. And as part of that, you have to make sure that an attempted update when the internet is not available does not fail and cause the system to become bricked or not useful to the user. Occasionally, one hears of someone with a connected vehicle that receives or attempts a software update, but they're in an area with poor internet connectivity, so they end up with a disabled vehicle, and sometimes that's out in the middle of nowhere, where it's actually a threat to their health because they're in the middle of the desert and their vehicle no longer drives. Best practices for embedded system security vulnerabilities include the following. More than anything else, be realistic about the vulnerabilities. Your system will have them, but it's important to understand them so you can come up with a viable security plan. Realize that users are not going to change default passwords in the common case unless there's a really effective way of ensuring that that happens. And even if they do change the password, they will probably use a weak password unless you have some measure that requires them to use a strong one. Counterfeit systems will be built. If you're successful enough to sell a lot of product, someone will attempt to counterfeit it one way or another, and you have to decide if that's an issue for safety or security. Anything on a network will be attacked one way or another. Simply being on an embedded network with an obscure protocol will make it a little bit harder for remote people to attack your system, but they will attack it when it's physically local, or they will attack it when someone has the bright idea of putting an internet adapter onto that network, exposing it to the internet. Pitfalls for security vulnerability include the following. Assuming users will practice excellent security hygiene. That assumption is probably incorrect for almost any device you can imagine. Using a master password is just a really bad idea. Don't do it. And a final pitfall is assuming attackers will not attempt to extract keys from at least one device. If you build a device, you have to assume an attacker will find some way to extract the secret keys from it, and then will use them against you. A specific instance of this pitfall is using symmetric cryptography and putting the same symmetric key in multiple devices. An attacker will get hold of one device, they'll extract the key, and now they'll be able to have the key to fake messages or software updates or whatever to all the other devices. Remember, the same symmetric key in all devices amounts to a master password, which we've already said is bad.